So, Fight Club. My title for tonight is The Battleground of the Mind. The Battleground of the Mind, where the enemy likes to play. So, the location where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha. Golgotha means? The place of the skull. If we want to be effective, and if we want to be victorious in the place of spiritual warfare, we must understand that the first field of conflict the enemy will ever have a go at anyone is right here in the strongholds of the mind, within the place of the skull. The beachhead of the enemy's lies about us exist in our minds, which is why Paul tells us to renew our minds. Now, there are many theologians. You pick up any book on spiritual warfare, there are the weirdest theories out there. Worse than the weirdest theories are the weirdest practitioners of spiritual warfare. Listen to me carefully now. These freaks exist in every church, which means ours too. They're out there with all their own theories almost exclusively based upon experience. And be very careful not to build a theology on your experience. Because everybody here walks a different road, but there's only one truth that never changes. Is that right? Anyway, there are good debates during the rounds. Where is the devil? Is he in hell? Is he on the earth? Is he in a dungeon? Can he dwell only in the world? Can he live in a Christian? These are good questions. I would like to just let some of you know who are convinced that the devil's on your case. I just want to say to you quickly, I doubt you're doing enough to get his attention. 55 what is it now? How many billion? Five billion, seven billion, eh? 7.5 billion people on earth. That's 5,500 million people on earth. And you're the one that's got all of hell looking at you. The devil is on me. I want to tell you what. If you're not raising the dead every three minutes and planting 18 churches a second, I doubt very much he even knows about you. Is that right? Where does the devil live? The devil dwells in darkness. Wherever there is darkness, he lives. It's that simple. And where there is spiritual darkness, his influence and possibly the presence of evil spirits exist too. There is a very real spiritual world there is a very real demonic world. I do not for one second believe Christians can be possessed by demons. I believe they can be oppressed. I believe they can be influenced. But when the Spirit of God dwells within you as a seal guaranteeing your eternity, you need to understand something. There was a guy in the Gadarenes who had a legion of demons in him, in one guy. That when chains would be all over him, he would break them among the prisons. A legion means about a thousand demons in one guy. That's a lot of demons. And he was not a Christian, which means they possessed him. And he calls out to Jesus, and I want you to notice what happens to this man. I'm not going to read it. But it says that the man of the Gadarenes ran to Jesus and it says he fell down before him and started to worship. One act of submission with a thousand demons in you and the demons will go to the pigs. Such is the power of God upon somebody's life. So any fear and distortion the enemy wants to put on you that he is so high and mighty 
You need to understand the authority that rests on the believer simply because of what he's given us. James Montgomery Boyce, one of my favorite commentators, in his commentary on the book of Ephesians, writes the following. Paul's view of the historical significance of the church couldn't be more in conflict with prevailing secular opinions. John Stott expresses it like this. Secular history concentrates its attention on kings, queens, and presidents, on politicians and generals, in fact, on VIPs. The Bible concentrates rather on a group it calls the saints. Often little people, insignificant people, unimportant people, who are, however, at the same time, God's people. And for that reason, they are both unknown to the world, yet well known to God. Secular history concentrates on wars, battles, and peace treaties, followed by yet more wars, battles, and peace treaties. The Bible concentrates rather on the war between good and evil, on the decisive victory won by Jesus Christ over the powers of darkness, on the peace treaty ratified by his blood, and on the sovereign proclamation of an amnesty for all rebels who will repent and believe. Again, secular history concentrates on the changing map of the world as one nation defeats another and annexes its territory and on the rise and fall of empires. The Bible concentrates rather on a multinational community called the church, which has no territorial frontiers, which claims nothing less than the whole world for Christ and whose empire will never come to an end. Does that encourage you? The view of the church according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for some Christians, the whole idea of spiritual warfare worries them because we came to Jesus as lost sheep, not as warriors. All right? Some of us just stumbled our way to the cross because we were so broken and messed up. We didn't come flexing our biceps. We came broken, needy, helpless, aware of our own sin. And then what happens? The Bible says that God comes, forgives us, redeems us, puts his name upon us, then puts a sword in your hand. And says, you might not have come in here a warrior. You might actually have been a warrior, W-O-R-R-I-E-R. Because some of us are particularly good at that. But you will leave here a W-A-R-R-I-O-R, a warrior. All right? Although many Christians may not want to initiate spiritual warfare, I mean, who wants to pick a fight? Huh? The Bible says even the angel... When contending with the devil about the body of Moses, said the Lord rebuke you. And the warning in scripture is we shouldn't go as Christians and meddle in stuff we don't know about. Listen now, there are too many Christians with a far greater interest in demonology than they should have. There are very real powers and principalities. There are very real things that can happen out there Listen now, about which the Bible is relatively silent for a reason, because God doesn't want us playing there. Are you listening to me? And there are certain things we may have got involved in and done that's very unhelpful. We need to bring it to him. And say, okay, Lord. The basic principle for our own sense of well-being is that we discern the areas of our own nature that's unguarded and open to satanic influence and satanic suggestion. Book of Jude verse 6 says, And the angels who didn't stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Commentators differ on the interpretation of these verses. The book of Jude is a very interesting book to try and work your way through. But one thing the commentators seem to more or less agree on is that it appears from this passage that the devil and the fallen angels with him have been relegated to live in darkness. Moral darkness, spiritual darkness. 
described as the place of the absence of God who is light. Okay? So you want to know where and how the devil is, where he's operating, is wherever there's darkness. He loves the darkness. He loves the night. There's reasons why, for those of you who like horror movies or have read or watched the, you know, Frankenstein and use those other creeps. <laughs> what did you say, Michael Jackson? <laughs> Thriller. <laughs> You know, those things, they always live at night. They come out in the night. They don't handle the daytime. Colossians 1 says this about us. And so from the day we heard, Paul writes, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God and being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, listen to these words, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That's where you are. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. You're in the light. There's a dominion of darkness. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Unlike those who don't know Jesus, every single Christian, no matter how strong or how weak your faith, if you believe in Jesus today, you've been taken out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's where God sees you. That's where angelic beings see you. You're not trapped in darkness any longer. You're no longer in prison. If you have faith in Christ, the Bible says you're in the light. You're okay. But if we tolerate or hold on to or hide areas of darkness, we open ourselves up to satanic influence. I'll explain some of that now. Willful disobedience to the word of God opens the door for darkness and demonic activity. When we know that there are bounds that God puts in place for us. I'll use a simple one. Drinking. If you come from a very Pentecostal background, if you drink, you're not even a Christian. Jesus turned water into grape juice, apparently. <laughs> now, I've read books, Sipping Saints. It says straight, it must have been grape juice. Why? Because why would Jesus make wine? Well, they all said it was wine at the feast. It's not hard. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. No one gets drunk on grape juice. You just wee a lot. The way they use the analogy of wine is because wine changes your behavior. Paul writes to Timothy and doesn't say take a bit of grape juice. He says take a bit of wine for the constant ailments you have. But the Bible says don't get drunk. Because when you're drunk, you lose. Yeah. So there are all these little boundaries God puts in place for us. We can be in the light, yet we can step into darkness in areas that's not helpful. Is that okay? So I know of a guy. I'm looking out to make sure none of you know him. <laughs> Just make sure he's not here. I know a guy who says you must live by such faith that you must stop all your medication. No matter what your medication is, stop it now. But the same guy, living with someone, not married, making her pregnant, claims to be a Christian. There's enough darkness there to sink a ship. Luke 11 verse 34 says this. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. In other words, what Jesus is saying here, if you understand the Greek text, is good eyes let light in, bad eyes don't. That's what he's saying. The implication is that an individual is responsible for receiving light. Based on this, which we're reading over here. So your eye becomes a lamp. Not in the sense that it emits light, but that it receives light. If you read what it's actually saying here. The real source of light is outside of the body needing to come in. 
It's only when we think we generate our own light that our light is darkness. People who walk into self-revelation, in other words, where God the Spirit hasn't taught you. People out there who say, I don't need to become a Christian but under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I will attain to a righteousness of my own. That light in them is actually darkness. It's not light at all. Because the only light is when Christ shines his light upon us. You understand? So your eye becomes the lamp of the body because it's what you see, what you receive, lights you up on the inside. It's not what goes this way, it's what comes this way. Are you all right? And so our spirit, being illuminated by the Holy Spirit, becomes the lamp of the Lord through which God looks into our hearts. Satan, on the other hand, has dominion in darkness. So he can move around and influence areas of darkness, even the darkness that exists in our hearts and minds. So the points I'm going to make in a moment <laughs> is that there is sufficient light, listen now, within every single one of us, who, in areas I'm going to show you now, where you may be battling, fighting a constant losing battle in a certain area. It might just be that in that area of your life, it's darkness instead of light. And we're going to talk about how to receive the light of the Lord that shines into it and just moves the darkness out the way. So you give the enemy no more space to come in. I know when I was young and I got scared, and there must be things under the bed. It's amazing how they all disappear when you put the light on. But in the darkness, your mind goes rampant. Switch the light on, everything's good. Unless you're married to someone who sleeps with curlers. <laughs> then you really freak out. Let's look at an area to try and understand what it's like with light and darkness. Okay, here's a, ref here's a reference point for you. You remember the story of Peter's denial of Jesus? We all know what happened. Peter failed. He denied Jesus. What isn't easily seen is the spiritual dynamic that was going on behind that scenario. Where you need to pay a bit of attention to you to try to understand what the enemy does with us. Jesus had predicted that Peter would deny him three times. It's pretty hard to figure out why Peter suddenly manifested this fear. Because if you read and you study the different disciples... Peter wasn't fearful by nature. He's the one who walked on water. He's the one who cut off the high priest's servant's ear in the garden. He's the one who confessed Jesus as the Christ. He's the one who pulled all those fish in on one account. He's the one who, when, when they heard about the resurrection of Jesus, he's no longer in the tomb. When John stops to have a look, it says Peter charged straight in. Peter's not scared. Human fear didn't cause him to deny Jesus. I mean, we know that he even went all the way to the fireplace where Jesus was being persecuted. He put himself in that place, and then suddenly something happened when a servant girl simply asked, what's your accent? He lost it entirely. Why? Luke chapter 22, verse 21. No, verse 31, sorry. Luke 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith might not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Now that's typical, Peter. I tell you, Peter. The rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times you even know me. Somehow Satan had asked for and received permission to sift Peter like wheat. He had been given an area of access into Peter's heart. There was some darkness somewhere. How did Satan accomplish this? After eating the Passover, Jesus tells his disciples, one of them is going to betray me. One of you. Now listen to his words. Verse 21, Luke 22, verse 21. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he's betrayed. And they began to question one another. Which of them could it be who's going to do this? 
Imagine being in that room right now. It's only 12 of you. And you're all looking at each other. One of you, because it's not me. One of you is a betrayer. And they're all arguing about who it is. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. The same verses. Jesus says, one of you whose hand is on the table with me is about to betray me. They all argue who it is. It's, ah, 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 not me. Must be one of you. But let's start a new conversation. Which one of us is the greatest? What is going on in this room? These disciples are having a very sober conversation. And they move from an attitude of shock and denial, it's not me, to an argument concerning which of them is greatest. You see what's going on, eh? There's an argument going on because if I'm one of the greatest, I'm not a betrayer. Because great people don't betray. Peter must have won the argument. He's loud. And he must have won that argument about who's the greatest. And Jesus picks on the loud mouth. And says, you, tonight, will deny you've known me three times. Satan has asked to sift you. You, he's asked to sift you. Sheesh, what's going on? I mean, his high visibility among the disciples must have left him with an air of superiority. I'm the one who's done the great things. Suddenly, darkness comes in. They were busy with an attitude of presumption and boasting. But Peter, lifted up by his own pride, I will never betray you. These idiots may. But I will go with you to prison. I will go with you to death. He forgets that Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty or a haughty spirit before a fall. The tripwire that Satan used to cause Peter's denial was Peter's own pride. There was a little bit of darkness inside. Hello, darkness, my old friend. There's a little bit of darkness inside. And Satan looks to manipulate the darkness in his own heart. And we need to understand that in spiritual warfare, it's the areas we hide in darkness or are just in darkness by default that are the areas of possible future defeat. Many times the battles we face won't stop until we discover and repent of the areas of darkness that are within us. Areas where we make agreement with the devil that are perversions of what God wants for us. You see, the devil only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so what happens is he gets into your mind and the biggest thing he will ever try and turn is your perception of yourself. The last thing the enemy wants is for somebody to start thinking like God wants them to think. The last thing God wants is that we open, uh, the last thing the devil wants is that we open the word of God and his word illuminates us into the lamp of the eyes that goes into us and causes light because he can't play there. He is only in darkness. And in darkness, you stumble. When the light's on, you can see. And sometimes, Jesus wants us to see what we really are in His eyes. And to do that, there's sometimes things we... What are the things you hide in the dark? Remember what I said this morning, blue bull jerseys and stuff. There are things you, there are things you hide in the dark. Because you don't want other people to know. Things you're ashamed of, things you try and pretend to be. All those are things where we give the enemy space to get in and begin to play. Begin to come mess around with us. But there's a wonderful backfire to the story. Because Jesus says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. In his words. Let me read them to you. But I have prayed that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So when Peter denied even knowing Jesus, how did his faith not fail? Huh? 
Because you see, I don't think for a moment Peter denied in his heart who Jesus is. What got into Peter was a sudden fear just for his own life. That's all. That's why Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. So even when you deny knowing me, it's out of a self-preservation. You've never actually questioned who I am because you're the one who said, I'm the Christ and flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. So you know full and, Peter, you're going to go through something now where you're going to know full and well who, you, who I am, but what's going to be questioned in your heart is your self-preservation. And I'm telling you, you'll deny knowing me three times out of your own self-preservation. Pride. At the roots of any pride is self-preservation. Holding on to yourself. And sometimes it's holding on to the self that God's trying to fix. And you hold on to that thing inside you. You know what happens? You become friends with that, and it begins to become your identity. And the reason you don't want to get free is because you don't know yourself outside of that. You don't know what you'd be like if this thing was no longer a problem for you. But he has the good news. Jesus says, listen, I've prayed your faith won't fail. So when you come back, in other words, you're going to drop. But when you come back, strengthen the brothers. What's going on here? I'm going to show you in a moment that the enemy's plans upon us always backfire. Always backfire. Because if you're a believer in this room this morning, tonight, you can't go far enough away from your Father in heaven that he can't help you. You cannot switch off all the lights sufficiently to be in total darkness once you're born again because the spirit of the living God who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and he says, I will never leave or forsake you. His spirit will keep and sustain and strengthen you. The worst that can happen is you'll be an unhappy Christian. It's the worst that can happen. But you can never fall away because he holds you. So James chapter 4 and verse 4 says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, of course, we're talking about systems, okay? Is that right? I'm going to talk about it next time. I'm not talking about the world. Louis Armstrong was not a Satanist when he said, what a wonderful world. Ha, ah, heathen. Look at that sunrise, heathen. Beautiful flowers. I mean, some of you dig flowers and arrangements and all that stuff. Satanists. <laughs> You're not supposed to love the world. Tomorrow morning, we should all send texts out. What a crummy sunrise. <laughs> hey? What a terrible sunset. Because I'm hating the world. Understand what he's trying to say. He's talking about the systems of the enemy. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit he's made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself. This is, this is the verse of spiritual warfare. In the whole, every book on spiritual warfare you'll ever read will use this as its proof text. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The good news for Peter and for ourselves is the devil will never ever be given permission to destroy a Christian. He may be given, however, a bit of permission to do a bit of sifting. Like wheat. God arranges it that the outcome of satanic attack, which is allowed through the permissive will of God, will cleanse the soul of pride and bring greater humility into our lives. You see, no matter what the devil throws at you, the process will feel lousy, but God causes it for your good, as the book of Romans tells us. To use the analogy of sift you like wheat, wheat has an outer husk and an inner kernel. The outer husk nature must die in all of us because it's that protective suit of armor that every one of us has is this outer husk. It's the part of you that gets smashed. It's not your spirit on the inside. It's your soul. It's that part of you that gets hurt and affected and broken and wounded and injured on the inside that causes us to react badly. That thing actually needs to die 
that the Christ life can emerge from us. And so sometimes the enemy intends things for harm and he sets us up in darkness and God in his grace says the enemy asked to sift you as wheat and I'm letting him. Some of us right now, you're not coping anymore. Because this morning you got up and released your angels that you know by name and you feed in the back door. And you send them and you commission them and you run all sorts of things the Bible doesn't tell us to do but because Todd Bentley does it, you're going to do it. Now, The process may feel lousy, but God's at it because God wants out of you the husk type outer nature to die. You see, Peter's outer nature was presumption and proud. His initial success made him ambitious and self-oriented. He's the number one. He's the spokesman for the disciples. He's the biggest mouth among them all. He's carried victories. He's carried successes. He's recognized as the leader of the group. The problem is it's got inside him. And God doesn't entrust his kingdom to people who haven't been broken of pride. You see, pride, I told you just now, that self-preservation of pride, pride is the armor of darkness itself. Because light finds it very difficult to get into a space that you out of fear are holding on to. On the inside saying, I don't want anyone to see the self-preservation is called pride. It's the armor that people use in which darkness hides. In fact, the definition of darkness, of pride, is this, a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. Isaiah tells us, isn't it, that it was pride that caused Lucifer the archangel to lose his place in heaven when instead of worshiping God, he said, I will be like him. Self-preservation. Why bow the knee to the king when I can be like him? Pride through him. And it was the pride in Peter's heart that opened the door. You see, the enemy's attack against Peter was strong, but it was measured. Because before the attack even comes, Jesus assures him and says, listen, he's asked to attack you. I'm going to let him. But when you get back, I want you to strengthen your brothers. It served the purposes of God. I reckon, it's, I reckon what's going on right now is that Peter was unaware of these areas of darkness within him. Left him open to attack. And I want to say this, whenever Jesus reveals sin in us, and what is the definition of sin? To miss the mark. Whenever we're missing the mark of what he wants for us as people, whenever God allows the enemy to ever go, we need to understand God allows it that he can not shame us, but destroy the devil's work. Bring it up, bang, in order to destroy it. And that's what happened with Peter. The greatest defense we could have against the devil is to just maintain an honest heart before God. When the Holy Spirit shows us an area that needs repentance, we must overcome the instinct to defend ourselves because God is opposing the proud. And when God starts to reveal things in us that aren't great, And we start to make excuses for it and to justify it, we fall back into dark corners. And then God himself begins to oppose us. Because he says, I oppose the proud. Those who protect themselves, I I oppose them. But I give grace to those who humble themselves. And in James chapter 4 verse 7, we learn it's in the context of repentance, humility, and possessing a clean heart that the devil flees. In the area of spiritual warfare, we must go beyond what many Christians have, which is a vague submission to God. Like, I'm submitted, I'm submitted. The areas that we deeply in our own hearts know aren't right, that need to be put under the blood of Jesus. We need to come and submit to him with intention. With intention. And say, Lord, here, I give this to you. I give you my personal battle. Someone once said, victory begins with the name of Jesus on your lips but will not be consummated until the nature of Jesus is in your heart. Start with him on your lips, but his nature must be in your heart. Okay. We can almost say that the devil will be allowed to come against areas of weakness in our lives until we realize that God's only answer is that we become more like Jesus. The reason the backfire works is because the devil will no longer continue to assault you. If the circumstances he designed 
to destroy you are now working to perfect you. That every trick he puts on you is actually making you better. Then he just backs off. He came and tempted Jesus three times. Three times Jesus stood with the word of God and the devil backed off. Because Jesus stood in his truth. Later on, later, later on, when God used Peter to heal a lame man, we see a very different and a very humble Peter. Acts 3 verse 11. The guy who's just been healed, while he clung to Peter and John, the, the, the guy to get beautiful, the paralytic, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, listen to the language, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As if though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. It's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob who's done this thing. Something happened in his life, an area of darkness of pride, where if there's one thing that Peter knew, it's that the self-interest that was hidden in the corner was exposed by the devil because God allowed it. And James chapter 4 verse 7 kicked in. And what Paul, Peter had to realize was this, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee. And the word of Jesus to him was, when you come back, Strengthen your brothers. I wonder how many of us in this room are in the place where we do not strengthen our brothers for the simple reason that we still live in the place of denial. How many of us right now in this room have areas in our lives where we're still living in denial when he wants us to step up and he wants us to start encouraging our brothers? And the thing we feel is, I'm not ready yet. It is probably one of the most common lies in the church today is how few of us stand up in the authority we have because all we're believing are the moments of failure, yeah. the moments of denial, the moments of saying, I, well, I was a big mouth that didn't work. I'm now shutting up again. I'm so scared the enemy has another go at me and causes me to fail again. It's the language of darkness. But Paul prays in Colossians that we would have our minds and our spirits and our lives filled with the knowledge of him. Let the light in. 